What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Healthspan Academy. I'm your host, Craig Shearhart, and joining me today is my special guest, Dr. Jennifer Haley, who is a dermatologist. She started her academic career with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Nutrition from Cornell University, went on to get her medical degree from Uniform Services University, and then became a licensed dermatologist, and recently has become the host of Radiance Revealed Podcast. So today we're going to talk all things skin and health related to longevity. Jennifer, thanks so much for joining me today. Sure. Sure. Thanks for having me, Craig. Please Cheers. tell me. Yeah. Awesome. So I want to kick this off with how the whole field kind of evolved for you. Was it like when you're in medicine, did dermatology just kind of speak to you or was it something you always wanted to get into? How did that sort of evolve? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think some of the best things in life happen serendipitously mm-hmm. and you have to be receptive to them. It might not be part of your plan. And yeah. I tend to be a planner. I tend to be pretty scheduled, pretty regimented, very routine oriented. And I had wanted to be a veterinarian oh, when I cool. went to Cornell. Yeah, they have a great vet school. And after working on the farm and realizing it wasn't playing with dogs every day, I changed uh, to med. So <laughs> when I went to medical school, I wanted to be a pediatrician, sort of okay. like the dog for dogs, right? Like the yeah. little one. Yeah. <laughs> Basically like animals and children, they can't speak for themselves. And I have an, a warm heart for that, you know? Yeah. So I went on to being a pediatrician. When I do things, I'm very gung ho. So I was president of the Ped Society. Every single rotation was pediatrics. Oh wow! One day during my fourth year of medical school, so I had everything laid out, whole plan for pediatrics. I was told I had to spend the afternoon in my clinicals in a specialty rotation. Okay. And the only option left was dermatology. I said, "Fine, that's easy enough. It's not like it's even a real doctor." <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just like people poppers. <laughs> exactly. That's yeah. what I think you're saying. Was right. Yeah. So I spent just an afternoon there, and I was amazed because we would go, you know, do laser in one room. It was the beginning of the lasers. It was in the mid 1990s. Right. And we'd do some acne, do skin cancer, Mm -hmm. do some surgery, you know, do a full skin check. We saw all ages of people, both sexes, and I I love the variety. I tend to get bored really quickly. Yeah. And I thought it was amazing that you can look at somebody's skin and know what was going on inside their body. Yeah, that's wild. Take a step back. Medicine's so divided. But if you take a step back, you're like, oh, we're just looking at any organ. This is the organ of the skin. Right. How it's perfused, what kind of nutrients it's getting. Yeah. How it's functioning at a cellular level and a physiological level is representing mm-hmm. all of your other organs. Yeah. So it gives you a lot of clues without being invasive or painful to anyone as to what's going on inside their body. That's so that's true. Why yeah. 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 That's amazing. Awesome. Um, so I don't want to jinx this, but it does seem to be getting warmer. So I think theoretically we may have to start <laughs> paying attention to the sun exposure. Um, at least it's getting warmer where we are. Um, so are you? Uh, I like near Toronto, just like an hour west of Toronto. So it's I'm been, in Arizona. So it's really uh, your warm is our hell hot. It's yeah. not. <laughs> <your degrees outside. laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. So I guess you have to deal with that all year round. So and, and I feel like the. So I've, I've spoken to a few dermatologists and it seems like the field is somewhat split on, on how we should expose ourselves to sun and whether we should ever be unprotected. We need vitamin D, some kind of prescribed getting it from diet as opposed to the sun. Where do you, where's your stance on that? Should we be basically in sunscreen every time we're exposed to it? Should we be unprotected at times? Uh, how, how do we know how much exposure is, is enough? Like, just give me your kind of spiel on that. Sure. Yeah. And and my opinion has evolved and changed over the years as well. So currently, you know, and you may hear me on the radio and other podcasts, you know, 10 years ago where I may have spoke differently, I was a little dogmatic about how much people should avoid the sun. Well, at the time I was living in Hawaii (laughs) where people had easy access to sun. So a lot of it depends on where you live, what your skin type is. Right and what time of year it is, right? Mm -hmm. But I do believe in getting your skin exposed to sun. Um, For someone who's fair skinned, like myself, three times a week for 10 to 15 minutes in what I call the non-high real estate areas of the body. So like for instance, this morning I went hiking, I took my jacket off and I exposed my midsection and my back and my chest for about 10 to 15 minutes while I was hiking. And I cover my head up because I don't want my face to have wrinkles and skin cancer and stuff. So I do wear a hat and sunscreen okay. deliberately on the back of my hands, my face, mm-hmm. my neck, and then just the top part of my chest that are exposed every single day, day in mm-hmm. and day out. Yeah. So those are the areas where we don't really want chronic sun exposure. 
But the areas that are going to be the most beneficial to help you create vitamin D, as well as help with other metabolic processes that I I know exist that we may not have yet discovered when it comes to mitochondria and energy, because sun is a photosynthetic kind of, you know, energy source. And I think it does Mm -hmm. energize us, not just through vitamin D, but through other Sure. Other processes and um, I the the torso, the legs three times a week. Now, if you have dark skin, if you're you know Hispanic, if you're African American, Asian, you're going to need a little bit longer. So we're looking mm-hmm. at twenty to thirty um, minutes three times a week. And those skin types tend to hyperpigment. So anywhere there's inflammation, like acne, tend to get brown spots. So another reason not right. to expose the face. Okay. Um, but it really depends on your latitude. Like here in Arizona, I have an advantage over you, you know, yeah. obviously because I'm going to get a little bit more conversion. I'm and then I'm slightly jealous. Sure, it's all right. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. It definitely keeps the mood up yeah. and then make sure you're taking vitamin, uh, vitamin D because mm-hmm. vitamin D allows the, um, not vitamin D, I'm sorry, magnesium, make sure that right. somebody magnesium. I like the bioptimizers of magnesium mm-hmm. because it contains all seven forms, but really any magne- magnesium is going to be somewhat beneficial in helping mm-hmm. the vitamin D convert to the active form in the skin. It cannot do so. So you can be in the sun all day long. And if you're deficient in, in magnesium, you're not going to be able to go into the active form of vitamin D. Right. Fair enough. Cool. Awesome. That's great. Um, <clears throat> and then can I just take a step back really quick when yeah, it comes sure. to sun protection? People will also often get a false sense of security with sunscreen. So I see people mm. doing a couple little sprays yeah. and then they go in the sun all day and they wonder why they're, uh, we'll why they're, the next day. <laughs> so yeah. you want to look for uh, a broad spectrum SPF. I prefer zinc oxide and avoid okay. all the chemicals. So something with zinc oxide SPF mm. 30 or higher, and then think of sunscreen as your backup plan. So I use it on the face, but I also wear a hat and I wear long sleeves. Okay. Because that's a physical barrier is going to be way better than sunscreen. And I personally don't like sunscreen on my arms. I never wear it. I go outside every day, three to four hours, mountain biking and hiking and stuff. And I just wear long sleeves. And I feel like that's much more beneficial, you know, except for that 10 minutes, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And then there's things people can supplement with like uh, polypodium leucotomus. There's an over-the-counter supplement called HelioCare, SunSafe RX. There's a whole bunch of them. It's a fern block extract. And that helps... Uh, to protect your skin from the sun damage from the UV radiation and increase at the level where you're going to burn. Okay. And those are taken orally? Yeah. It's just a supplement. I take a couple of pills every day. And if you're out for long periods of time, you want, you want to take more. Mm. And uh, it's uh, it's just called HelioCare. It's common, the most common one, but the, cool. the ingredient is polypodium leucotomus. Awesome. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, so let's, let's shift gears a little bit into uh, household products. And this is something that I've I've dabbled in the last year, just kind of like I mean, as far as I've gone is like just look, seeking more natural products that have kind of less ingredients, but I'm hoping you get a little bit more technical description and, and then recommendations from you. Um, when we talk about like shampoos, deodorants, cleaning supplies, like stuff that gets exposed to our skin, are there specific chemicals that we should be avoiding that we see on an ingredient list or what are the red flags to look for? I, I don't like most chemicals. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> say I'm completely natural. I mean, I really don't like to wear deodorant very often. Yeah. Um, I think if you shower and you have a healthy skin microbiome, your body mm. actually takes care of itself. Yeah. Um, you know, the aluminum and the other ingredients in deodorant and antiperspirant can be kind of harmful to you. Mm-hmm. I am a huge fan of essential oils. Right. They have to be um, diluted with fractionated oil, like coconut oil. Mm-hmm. And uh, they that's what I use to clean. So I'll take a little bit of um, soap and um, some essential oils, and I use that to clean my counters every day. So when my kids are eating off the counter, I don't worry too much. Yeah. And there's no, there's none in particular that I think is any more scary than the others. You know, obviously right. with foods and glyphosates and all of that. You, yeah. you know, and with, uh, with um, cosmetics, I don't really like anything with phthalates, okay. which is found in plastics and on receipts because yeah. it's a known endocrine disruptor. So I never mm-hmm. take a receipt at the grocery store. I don't care for hand sanitizer. It's pretty awful. But if you're going to make your own, you want to do it with aloe, some right. alcohol and some essential oils and not all the other stuff that's in there. Yeah. Aloe is the jam. I love my aloe. Yeah. Um, so as, as you talked about the uh, microbiome, uh, that kind of is a nice kind of segue into the, into gut health. We know these are very tightly linked together and like the, your, the, basically the appearance and health of your skin is often like kind of reflective of what's going on in your gut. 
Uh, talk about that relationship and how we can start maybe implementing some some better gut health and how that may improve our, our skin health. Yeah. So a lot of people may or may not have heard of the gut, skin, brain access. Mm-hmm. So all of these areas are intertwined and it's sometimes hard to understand that. The skin and the gut is easier to understand because if you think of your mouth as the opening to your entire gut, yeah. and then it comes, you know, your anus is on the other side and mm-hmm. it just goes around to skin again. So it's yeah. a continuous sort of thing. Right. And a lot of the serotonin and the um, neuromodulators that are necessary for proper brain function are made in the gut. That's why often people who have poor gut health also have mood issues mm-hmm. or, um, maybe some volatile personality issues right. and things like that, Memory which laps, yeah. I think, right. And I think yeah. it's empowering to know that you can change like mm-hmm. your behavior and your thoughts, yeah. your perception of the world by having a healthy gut. It's pretty sure. Yeah. So, um, unfortunately we really don't have a consensus or a lot of knowledge on, I can't say, Hey, Craig, take this probiotic <laughs> and this is going to solve all of your problems. What we do know is that the more variety that you have in your gut, the better. Mm. Dirty carrots picked out of your garden, awesome. You know, yeah. they have enzymes in them to help you digest. So right. you want to have, you don't want to be ultra clean. You want to be a little bit dirty. Right. That's part of it. And then having fermented foods is going to be better mm. than a probiotic. I do right. take probiotics. There's a couple. There's one um, called Lactobacillus rhamnosus, R H A M N O S U S, SP1, that's linked to improving acne. Hmm. But I wouldn't say just that, right? If you can find a probiotic with lactobacillus rhamnosus SP1, and you take that with a healthy diet with fermented foods and maybe some prebiotic fiber, that's going to be even more beneficial for you. Right. Um, having just taking a step back, having a healthy gut microbiome and skin microbiome basically keeps everything in balance in your body. Like mm-hmm. we want bacteria, we want yeast, we want all of these things on our body, but mm-hmm. we want them. Uh, in a symbiotic, uh, unified, protective way, not where one has the opportunity to outgrow the rest. That's when we right. get disease. Right. Fair enough. And uh, one, uh, like a sort of aha moment for me was when um, I was interviewing my uh, my naturopath, and she like said like we're not just eating for us; we're eating for a whole microbiome. So like it's basically basing your your nutrition intake about. Um, what your little bugs inside you need too. So you're not just eating for, for like one organism, right? It's just kind of like, but you never really think that. And it's kind of creepy to think that, but, <laughs> but it's helpful. I know a huge amount of our DNA and a huge amount of our weight is actually microbes. It's yeah. not even our own body. Yeah, that's and wild. What I find fascinating is what your microbes are is kind of what you crave. Yeah. So I could tell I'm not like in, in a healthy mood when I'm craving sweets all the time, especially uh-huh. if you don't eat a meal. And then you crave a little bit more sweets. That's usually a good indicator that you have a little candida overgrowth. Right. Huh. I've been introducing some sauerkraut lately, and now I'm kind of hooked on it. I crave the sauerkraut, <laughs> which for me is unusual because I used to think it's gross. Yeah. Now I'm thinking, why am I craving this? Because I think my microbes crave it, right? Because they yeah. need huh. feed them well. It's fascinating. That's wild. That's so super fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, let's talk. So getting into a little bit more specifics with skin, collagen obviously is a huge, uh, like, component to the healthy skin. Um, talk about it. Like, do we, do we, how, do we know, how much do we know about collagen supplementation and, and what, how that directly impacts our collagen kind of makeup in our connective tissue? Um, or are there other diet dietary recommendations for supplementation that you kind of recommend? Oh gosh, there's so much. Okay. So just with collagen, I did have a good episode. I can connect you with Charlie from CB supplements. Mm-hmm. Um, they make a beautiful collagen. The reason I like their collagen is because it's, um, It's sourced well, you know, grass fed, but it's also from marine eggs, cows, the whole gamut of collagen. Mm. So just like everything, you want to have as much variety as possible when you're consuming a collagen. The studies on collagen, we don't see, it's hard to see direct links over many, many years. But what we have seen very well in the studies is improved skin hydration and improved barrier. So that's Mm. a lot because even if you want to reduce the appearance, the wrinkles, it, the simplest thing is to increase hydration of your skin. Mm. So like, for example, in Arizona, I'm always like, oh, my skin looks so crinkly. And I look back to Hawaii where there's humidity in the air and your skin just looks nicer when it's more moist. So right. you want your skin to look better. The first thing to do is increase the hydration. So right. externally with moisturizers, hyaluronic acid, internally with 
you know, water and also with things like collagen can increase the hydration of your skin surprisingly. So I think the risks of collagen are low if you're sourcing it properly and the benefits are there. Certainly Mm. sometimes, you know, there's some reports for joints and then for skin and hair and nails, it's, it's soft, but the, the data are starting to come in and we're seeing more and more benefits with fine lines and wrinkles and hydration and improved barrier function, which means less, uh, chance of dryness, less chance of uh, eczema, things like that. Awesome. This is going to segue really well into my next question because I was going to ask about temperature. <laughs> we can plan this, everyone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but so hydration, obviously, like like is that as simple as just heat exposure and sweat and exercise? Is that like has that been linked into like healthier skin? Uh, you mean uh, is just sweat? Like, yeah, just perspiration. Is that like? Oh, um, has hydration. I mean, has sweating been linked to good skin? I think any, anytime you move things along, you're going to benefit. So Mm -hmm. when you think about uh, getting rid of toxins and metabolic byproducts from the body, we do it through sweat. Mm -hmm. We do it through inhaling and exhaling. Mm -hmm. We do it from urination. We do it through defecation and women do it when they menstruate every month. Mm -hmm. So some of the worst hormonal problems I see, you know, I speak with women who have jaw acne and they're going to the bathroom number two, like twice a week or once a week. And that's just, you you need to move through things through your body. So sweating is really essential in order to move things through your body. Mm -hmm. Um, As far as if it makes the skin better, I can't really say, I can't think Mm -hmm. of any studies that have looked at, you know, if you're sweating more, does it make your skin better? But I mean, it improves your health. And at the end of the day, if you're improving your health, by getting rid of maybe mercury from the sushi you had last week through yeah. your sweat in the yeah. sauna, you're going to have better skin. So anything yeah. that improves your health is going to improve your skin. Sure. But people, some people are driven by weight. Some people are driven by vanity. Some people are driven by other components of health. You know, but at the end of the day, all of the things that we do and we choose to do put us in the direction of better health, better skin, better weight, mm. or yeah. worse. You know. Yeah. Fair enough. Not cool. all or nothing. It's just do the best you can. <laughs> yeah. No. Totally. I fully agree. Um, so yeah, my next te- question opposite of heat is cold. And uh, we know there's a lot of anecdotal, uh, data that shows that cold benefits us. Um, I'm personally not a fan of the cold, just not great for my mental health. So I tend to keep put that last on my list of health things to do. Um, but the other piece to it is I, I question whether the long-term effects of cold effects is great for our skin was it, cause I just think like anecdotally, the warmer cultures kind of talked about this a little bit is that the people from warmer cultures that seem to have more vibrant skin and people that are from cold just seem to be dried up and like, man, it's just actually the, the, the short-term effects of the cold. Has there been research on that on the long-term effects of cold on the skin or what is your take on that? Yeah. I haven't seen research showing, you know, people who live in cold environments because there's too many components. I mean, yeah. is it because they're deficient in vitamin D chronically? Is it there? There could be so many things, mm-hmm. but I can tell you my observations. So. I've worked and lived everywhere from Hawaii, California, Arizona, Thailand, Washington, D.C., and then the mountains of Colorado and Utah. Huh. And my observation is that people are much more predisposed to broken blood vessels and rosacea type skin when they're at the elevated areas of um, the mountains where there's a lot of cold and harsh right. wind, and who knows. But I mean, who knows exactly what the cause is? It could be, sure. the, you know, it might not even be the cold. Um, but as far as like cold plunges, those are very beneficial. So, um, although I have to say like what you're talking about, I was wondering yesterday, I was at my gym, we have a cold plunge and it, uh, it's set to 42 and I'm saying, can you please raise it to maybe 50 at least <laughs> they sit in there for three minutes, you know, on my rest day to recover, right. After yeah. like hard mountain biking and, um, leg day. And I'm sitting in there for three full minutes trying to do the breathing. And I'm thinking, I wonder if this is exploding my blood vessels, you know, yeah. because it's so <laughs> vigorous and intense. Yeah. It does raise dopamine. Um, mm-hmm. I have a continuous glucose monitor on my arm. My glucose dropped down by 20. Yeah, I've like, heard that too. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's pretty remarkable. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's a lot easier when you know you're going back to 95 degree weather to jump in a cold plunge for minutes. <laughs> yeah. you know you're, you're not going. stuck there for weeks at a time. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Like there's no way you're going to get me in the sauna right now. So I think it's having that, um, that hormesis effect. Mm-hmm. So um, your audience might be familiar with the hormesis effect, but it's extremely important. And if you think about everything you do in this world, it should 
push the hormesis, like it should push hormesis in some way. So if you look at a car, a car is going to wear down over the years. The more you use it, the more it wears down. That's mm-hmm. what happens to machines, your refrigerator, cars, you know, any sort of mechanical thing. Mm-hmm. Our bodies, the less you, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. Right. If you want to build bone and muscle, you've got to exercise. If yeah. you want to increase your brain capacity, you have to study and think and get yeah. out of the routine. You have and to stress the tissues robust. just enough to create that adaptive response. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's not, it, you don't want to push too much where you get, you know, a brain injury or, you know, a broken mm-hmm. leg or, you know, or just find that happy dose, that happy medium dose of stress mm-hmm. to, to make things stronger. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. The more you push it, the stronger it gets. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to stay in our comfort zone. You know, when we're sitting at 68 to 72 degrees all the time, the body's never going to get stronger if we just do that. So we have to push it out. But I don't know if chronically doing so is the best thing. Just like a little fasting is good, but chronic fasting sets up cortisol response, you know? So true. Yeah. Everything in moderation. I'm I, f- fully on board with that. And that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> makes me justify my, my moderate use of cold. Um, <laughs> Cool. Uh, exactly this famous dermatologist and I was dying when I, he launched his skincare line, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago and invited a bunch of us to Beverly Hills. And he's talking about how boxers have the best skin because they get punched in the face. I don't know if this is going to be a video, but they get punched in the face. And by tapping and stimulating your face, it stimulates the collagen to get thicker. And we were all laughing, but I think he's a little right. I think there's yeah. a little bit of truth to that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. <laughs> that's crazy. It's going to tear blood vessels, but people that have the most wrinkles are always afraid to touch their lower eyes. And I'm like, why? You know? Right. Yeah. Fair enough. That's fascinating. Cool. <laughs> um, I want to, I've seen in some of your episodes, you talk a little bit about uh, hair and hair is obviously a little bit, um, you know, the superficial tissue is connected to skin. Um, how much do we know about how much we can control the natural hair loss process? Are there tangible steps is like, I think there's a little bit linked to diet stress. Um, in your kind of research, what, what's your take on how much control we have over that? Yeah. So, um, well, I can tell you that I've been very interested in hair since I was young because most of the women I'm, in my family are bald Oh, really? and it's gen- Yeah. And Mm. I, when I was, I'm 50 right now. And when I was 19, I got a sunburn on my scalp and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have a bald head. And I had these memories of my dog running around with my grandmother's wig around the house, like tearing it up. Like it was an animal. I'm like, I don't want to wear a wig. So I've always been interested in hair. There's many, many different types of hair loss, right? There's entire books written on hair loss, but what we can focus on is, you know, female pattern hair loss and male pattern hair loss, Mm. where the hair gets thinner over time. And typically the hair does get thinner over time, you know, whether it's decreased blood flow to the area, because everything is blood flow. If we think about the health of our skin, the health of our organs, the health of our hair, the more blood flow we have going to the area, the more nutrients are going to be delivered, the more oxygen is going to be delivered and the more metabolic waste products are going to be taken out. So you Mm -hmm. want to have that constant circulation of blood flow and lymphatics and, you know, Mm -hmm. moving things back and forth. And so if blood flow is decreased, then that's going to be an issue. Hormones can also play a role. So that's where things like um, women supplementing with progesterone and um, and estrogen around menopause and men taking maybe some finasteride to help minimize the conversion of testosterone to DHT, which causes the, the hair thinning can, can play a role. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas like minoxidil or Rogaine, that will increase the blood flow. That's how we think it works. We don't really know 100%. And then there's things like low level laser light therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically like a little cap. Um, I can give you a link for that if if your uh, audience wants to order some. They have caps, they have bands, and then they have combs that uh, emit a low level laser light therapy that stimulates Mm -hmm. the hair follicles to get thicker. So as long as someone has a hair follicle there, what typically happens with male pattern baldness is the hair on the back of the head but above your neck is thick. If you pull one in at the front of the hair, it's really thin. The caliber mm-hmm. is thinner, but right. as long as the hair follicle is still there, it has the potential to regenerate. Huh. And then things like thyroid obviously can affect hair growth as well. Right. And then over the last couple of years, what we've been seeing a lot of is telogen effluvium, which is whenever there's a major insult to the body, like um, COVID, stress, death mm-hmm. in the family, it could be emotional or physical, like a severe illness. Mm -hmm. or loss of a loved one, um, about three to six months later, the hair can just kind of fall out in clumps. 
So when I speak with someone, I ask them, is your hair coming out in clumps or is it just getting slowly thinner over time? And that kind of helps divide what category I'm putting them Mm -hmm. in and and go from there. Cool. Awesome. That's very insightful. There's Um, a lot we can do, but unfortunately it's not simple. So if someone's noticing hair thinning, what I recommend is just getting them on minoxidil or Rogaine, maybe doing a ketoconazole shampoo. It's like an antifungal shampoo over the counter, get a stronger prescription strength. And use that a couple times a week for three to five minutes in the scalp and it stimulates some hair growth and then maybe some low level light therapy lasers. And then if there's any scarring or anything associated with it, um, it doesn't look like what you see on your Google search, then you need to be seen by a board certified dermatologist. Fair enough. That's awesome info. Um, Let's uh, shift gears a little bit into um, this may not be as applicable to you in Arizona, but we have like uh, legitimate um, uh, seasonal uh, Mm -hmm mental disorders happening uh, just with lack of sunlight and, and stuff like this, especially in, in sort of uh, the colder parts of the world. Um, have you looked much into, into sun lamps and their impact? Yeah. So I had terrible seasonal affective disorder, which is why I left upstate New York when I went to mm. Cornell. Yeah. I mean, so bad. I lived the very first house in college town. I couldn't even get the energy to leave my house and go next door oh, sandwich or something. That's brutal. And looking back, I think it's vitamin D deficiency, a lot right. of it. Yeah. So Number one, I'd make sure the vitamin D is optimized. And I like mm. vitamin D3 with K2. No one overdoses if you're doing 5,000 IU a day. Right. And I think the recommendations generally are about 1,000 IU for every 25 pounds of ideal body weight. It's okay. a good start. So for me, that's about 5,000 a day. And then make sure you're taking magnesium with it. Yeah. Sun lamps, oh, I don't know. I mean, as a dermatologist, I can't really recommend them. Yeah, so fair enough. Vit- a lot of... Um, Gosh, I shouldn't, I should keep up with this, but a lot of the uh, tanning salons used to advertise no burn. Hmm. And when you look at your ultraviolet radiation, so it's UV radiation, you're actually getting radiated. When you're looking at ultraviolet rays, there's UVA, which are the deep penetrating rays Mm -hmm. that don't cause burning. Okay. So they come in through the window. If you've ever looked online at uh, images of truck drivers where the left side of their face is all wrinkled and the right side isn't from driving. Oh, right. yeah. In the United States, obviously, and yeah. in, it would be the opposite. Yeah, And that's from the UVA rays. That's why you need to have sunscreen and sun protection even when you're driving or sitting near a window. Right. And a lot of the tanning salons, what happened is they took out the UVB rays so that you only get the UVA rays because the UVB rays are the burning rays. So right. the UVA is aging and the UVB is burning. It's the easiest way to think about it. And Do we know if one or the other is more linked to, to cancer? Um, they both are because they're okay. different. Like UVA is more likely, um, it, it disrupts collagen and, and DNA at a different level than the UVB. Fair and enough. the UVB can cause um, basically like cellular apoptosis or, or death and tra- like trauma to the, to the cell. So they both are linked. Um, melanoma, for instance, is more associated with uh, recurrent sunburns, whereas basal cell cancer, squamous cell cancer are more associated with chronic sun exposure. So gotcha. they both play a role. But UVB, this is important for the audience to understand, UVB is essential for making vitamin D. Mm. So if you're getting into a sun lamp or a sun booth where they have the burning rays taken out, you're not getting your, your UVB. So you're not mm. even getting the vitamin right. D, you know, create, which you need to create you're only getting the A, which really causes a lot, a lot of aging. And I'm just not a fan of it because you're mm-hmm. not even getting the morning of being burned. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm really not a fan. I'd rather you like save your money and go on a little vacation once, <laughs> once <laughs> to somewhere. Yeah. Warm. I know it's essential to get um, light and I'm more of a fan of uh, red light therapy. Mm. So I, I mean, the BioLite, the Juve, and I think there's another main company that has um, red light therapy. And red light therapy has been shown to help with your vision mm. and your mood and things like that. So getting up in the morning and getting in front of a red light, I think is way more beneficial than a sun lamp. Yeah, I do a bit of both. Um, and I can't say with a, a lot of certainty that either is doing, making, doing a major thing, but I, uh, there's a, enough research that it's it's kind of led me to get, at least give it a shot. And it's, it, I have noticed just anecdotally a little bit better mood. Maybe it's that also we're getting closer to, to spring here in Canada, but the hope is back. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, like if you're going in, I, you know, and this sounds cavalier coming from a dermatologist, but I've been doing this long enough that I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, the end of the day, if you're getting in a sun, a sun lamp three times a week, 
like you're getting way less sun than I'm getting every day. <laughs> just walking yeah. to my mailbox and walking to my dog because I get a lot of sun, you know. Yeah. But I, I really do like to preserve as a woman, especially. And after seeing so many skin cancers over the last mm. 20 years of practicing, yeah. I like to preserve the face, the neck, and the sure. chest and the back of the hands. Yeah, that's so. totally fair. Awesome. That's great. That's super insightful. So I'm I'm curious to get uh your take on, I mean, I assume like everyone's routine, just like anything else, is going to be kind of specific to their needs. Would you have a general recommendation for skincare routine in terms of like oils, supplements, like something just kind of a quick elevator pitch that uh, people can kind of go out and give a shot? That's such a male question. Like oils <laughs> and supplements and skincare, like it's yeah, yeah. so different. So women would be like, well, how many skincare things do you recommend? You know, so yeah. Um, basically, the simplest thing that I would recommend for everyone. Mm-hmm. I'll modify it a little bit. If you have acne, I'm not a fan of vitamin C for you. Okay. But typically cleanse in the morning. If you're really lazy, you can do like I do. I take a toner and I put it on an exfoliating round. Basically, they have those exfoliating cotton rounds like at any drugstore. And I take toner and I, I rub it on my face to remove any dirt or oil or skin cells from overnight. And then I do a quick rinse. Okay. So okay. that could be your lazy cleanse in the morning. At night, if especially for women wearing makeup or anyone who spends a lot of time outside or getting dirty, you definitely need to use a real cleanser. I tend to like uh, salicylic acid mm. as an ingredient in cleansers for most skin, really, <clears throat> excuse me, for most skin, because it's, um, it's great if you're oily. It's great if um, you're in, you have like rosacea or redness prone to your skin because it's mm. anti-inflammatory. Right. Only time I wouldn't really love it is if you're super dry and you don't have a lot of oil glands, then you might want to go with something like glycolic acid or or a more hydrating kind of moisturizing cleanser. So okay. cleanse or tone. And then um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then in the morning, vitamin C. And the type of vitamin C you choose is extremely important because it's very volatile. It, you know, we're exposed to light or oxygen and it turns mm. orange and it's no longer active and protecting yourself. Mm. from free oxidant, you know, free radical oxidative damage. So you want to get a high quality vitamin C and then sunscreen. That's simple. And then at night you want to do your cleanse and then a vitamin A like retin-A or tretinoin or retinol and then a moisturizer and an eye cream. And that's really the simplest, best thing that everyone can do. Awesome. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to shift gears a little bit into your personal habits, kind of for more for a general scope. we obviously can get lost in the world of biohacking and skincare, and especially when we're coaching or uh, working with patients and can we get pulled in all these different directions. I'm curious to know what is at the top list of your, your personal health, fitness, um, and wellness and what do your habits look like around that? Yeah. So, um, I really, really need to exercise for mm-hmm. my mental well-being. Um, as I've, I've always lifted weights, weights is really important. I've done a couple of fitness competitions. I like lifting weights. Nice. I like the weight weight sculpt your body and you control your shape using weights. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting for me because yeah. I, I love to play with my body and see how cool. I can, you know, change it and stuff. Yeah. So I love, love doing weights. I do weights. Uh, usually when I'm in, I, I spend most of my year in Arizona and then the summer I get out and I go to Park City, Utah, and mm-hmm. I don't do that much, um, that much weights there, but I'm mountain biking a lot and doing other things where I am using my upper body a little bit. So I'm more heavy on the weights right now until I go there. So it's like five days a week, maybe six. And then I probably am like one or two days when I'm there, but I always do weights. It's so essential for bones and for muscles, especially if you get older, it's really good for balancing your hormones. Mm -hmm. I have male patients well into their late sixties that don't need testosterone replacement and their testosterone's in the high eight, nine hundreds, just from doing weights and being, and living a healthy life. That's amazing. Yeah. So I think weights are really grip strength too. That's like, that was a big eye opening for me is grip strength is like a higher mortality link than our cardiovascular health. So like obviously keeping strong and having a reserve of strength is super important when we talk about aging as well. Yeah. And my grip strength has never been that great. So that's always something that I'm working on. Like I have a yeah. strong back from rowing in college, but my grip is always what holds me back. So mm. weights are great. And then um, I do cardio for my mental. So right. if start to get agitated or irritable. All my friends will be like, go outside and go do something. Yeah. <laughs> so for me, that's mental. I personally am at my best body weight when I don't do a ton of cardio. 
ironically, because it just increases my appetite and I become a voracious, and my appetite becomes mm. voracious. But I like to do stuff outside in nature. I won't, I'll never get on a machine. I mean, I've run marathons just to show that I could, but I was never yeah. great at them. And um, I like to hike and I like to mountain bike. So those are really important to me. And then skiing, surprisingly, we're getting snow. So I'm heading up tomorrow to go ski. Oh, wow. And it's just about doing things I love. So yeah. I think, that, you know, one of the reasons I started my podcast, which is currently on pause, but there's a ton of episodes if people want to listen, is mm -hmm. because um, there's a lot of things that make someone radiant. So uh, while I've worked in the office, you know, for many, many years, I've seen people that have unlimited budgets and spend so much money on making themselves look more beautiful, but they didn't really look radiant to me. Something was missing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to seek out what that was. So that's why I talked to so many health experts and you know, I think a lot of what makes you a radiant person when you walk in a room or as a man, you know, just having that je ne sais quoi, I think is what they call it. Like yeah, that you can't that, really put your finger on it. That electricity, like, that, uh, yeah. It's an energy, right? It's yeah. just, it's the thoughts you put in your head. So if you're sitting here and you're listening, you're like, oh, I should work out more. I'm so lazy. I'm awful. Mm. I don't work out as much as you. That's because you're not choosing something you love. So yeah. do something you love. It might be dancing. It might be walking with a friend. I walk with my neighbor every night and we catch up on the day and yeah. you know, just find something that you love that brings you joy. And that's going to sure. make you radiant and healthier and yeah. happy. Fully yeah. agree. It's impossible to be angry when you're, when you're dancing. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It is. It is. Yeah. And for most men, it's impossible to be sober when you're drinking. I mean, when you're dancing. <laughs> True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So exercise is really important. I drink a lot of water. If my urine isn't clear, I drink more. Yeah. Um, I have gotten into fulvic and humic acid in the last year and a half. And I feel like it really helps with my electrolytes. I mm -hmm. use one from Beam Minerals. I have no conflict of interest. It's just B-E-A-M. Mm -hmm. And I add a little bit of that to my water, especially if I'm sweating a lot. Um, so supplements. <laughs> yeah. If you have supplement recommendations. Uh, I take sure. too many. I take too many. And I recently had elevated I have a huge birth. list too. And I used to like be cold turkey like just let me get everything from natural sources but it's got it's just grown like i just like i guess i've rabbit holed a little too much in the, in the literature and now i'm taking everything no i agree and the more you like are in this world the more you want to try everything yeah. you know like i'm yeah. a huge fan of spermidine have you heard of spermidine mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. huge fan of spermidine um and then I do the resveratrol and the NAD, not yeah. as high as David Sinclair will recommend because my budget doesn't really quite allow for, you know, a, a thousand milligrams a day. So yeah. I do 400, mm -hmm. 400, and then cycle. So everything should cycle. So mm -hmm. whether it's skincare, whether it's exercise, whether it's supplements, we're meant to cycle, just mm -hmm. like the cycle, just like women's cycle and the moon sure. cycles. Yeah. Everything should be looked at quarterly at least. Mm. Um, and then, you know, Dr. Sinclair has mentioned that, you know, not doing the resveratrol every single day in the NAD is more beneficial than doing it every day. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah so I, we don't I want don't... to do it every day. We want our body to kind of crave and reset sort of like hyperbaric oxygen. It works better mm -hmm. when you stop it and then yeah. your body gets into that hormesis. Yeah. That's a pretty bright guy too. I'd probably trust 99% of what, <laughs> what he says without any question. <laughs> Someone who's dedicated their life to longevity. Yeah. I think we should take his advice. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I know. Cool. Um, yeah, so those are the big ones. And then I love like for skin, I love astaxanthin. It's okay. basically from the, it's the, the thing that makes salmon turn pink and shrimp mm. turn pink. Gotcha. Krill. Yeah. So I love that for skin. It adds like a nice vitamin glow to skin. And then I've upped my vitamin uh, C quite a bit because mm. I don't like fruit. You know, I know it's weird. I just don't oh. really like fruit. Maybe wow. blackberries. That's about it. Fair enough. So, and then I, I just do, you do lemon water. What was that? Do you do lemon water? No, I don't no? because I feel like the citric acid, it, it eats away the enamel at my teeth. Oh, okay. So I don't, and I know a lot of people do. It's, I don't like it, but I, I mean, I have heard that lemon water in the morning when you wake up, you know, kind of gets delivered to just kind of detox a little yeah. bit. What you do? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like it. I mean, I'm also just addicted to soda water with the lemon in it. So it's just, uh, yeah, I, I, just the most yeah. refreshing thing in the world to me. Yeah. That's more so than the, than the health benefits, but 
I've got hibiscus here. I've got some hibiscus tea. So that's as much as I'm going. Yeah. Cool. But I know it's great. I completely agree with you. It's just, I have a little bit of an aversion to it. So I don't do it. Yeah. Fair enough. Awesome. Well, Jen, this has been an amazing chat. I really appreciate the time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Craig. So fun chatting with you. And I hope that I was uh, informative for your Absolutely. audience. What's the best way for people to learn more from you? So I backed off a little bit on social over the last few months just to kind of go in and have some reflection and, and peaceful time, but um, Fair enough. I'll be back up and going. So the best way is through Instagram. I'm okay. at Dr. Jen Haley, D-R-J-E-N-H-A-L-E-Y. And then uh, you can listen to some episodes on my podcast, Radiance Revealed. If uh, you're in the U.S. and you want to do a telemedicine consultation with me, I work through a platform called Dermatologist on Call. Awesome. And my website is Dr. Jen Haley. So, Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Well, we'll link to all your goodies in the show notes. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks again for your time. Okay, bye, Craig. Cheers. Well, thanks for doing this episode of Healthspin Academy, guys. We're going to see you next time. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks for tuning in today. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Thank you so much for supporting this channel. This has been a fun project. We are growing in viewership every single week, and we obviously couldn't do that without you. So thank you for continuing to tune in. I really hope you're getting value out of the, the programming and the content. Just wanted to give you a heads up. I've been working on a, a book on health and longevity the last couple of years, been collaborating with my colleague, Dr. Dan Vitale, who's uh, an expert in the field as well. And we, we've basically just kind of summarized the literature, some of the techniques that we found really useful in the world of biohacking, what our exercise regimen looks like, what's, you know, cardio type stuff is going to help us live longer and healthier, a mobility work, nutrition. We've covered the whole spectrum, everything that you can basically be in control of in your health and fitness kind of moving forward to help you live as healthily as possible for as long as possible. And it's available free for download. So if you click on the YouTube banner, you'll see a link to download the, the blueprint. It's also on our Instagram profile or on the website. You can click on fivepillarmethod.com slash optimize to get your free copy of the book. And I hope you enjoy it. Hope you're keeping well. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time. 